Hi there and Happy New Year to everyone. I'm Mike Bird from the Nazareth Nicaea podcast and vodcast, the program where we look at all things related to Jesus, Christology and the early church. We're continuing on in our series on Philippians 2, 6 to 11. In previous episodes, we've looked at the source and genre of this piece of text, you know, whether it's a, a hymn or it's a poem, I've argued it's most likely a poem of some kind. We've also looked at the meaning of the phrase morphe theu or form of God, where I argued it does have a kind of mix of both visual resplendence and divine honor at stake. Uh, today, however, I want to look at verse six in some depth. And I want to look at two particular things. I want to explore the phrase equal with God and that very tricky and that very disputed Greek word harpagmos. You know, does it mean snatching, grasping, robbery? What's the deal with harpagmos? So that's what we'll do. So let's let's break that down. Let's let's jump then into equal with God. Now, there's three things I want to say about this. First, to be equal with God, it, it means something like being on par with God or sharing in the divine being or participating in divine authority. It's got some level of sameness with God, though it's not clear uh, how far that equality extends. You know, equal in what sense? Equal in what degree? Now, we will get into the real nut of the debate soon is whether Jesus was already equal with God or whether he refused to seize after equality with God. You know, more on that in a minute. But the key thing is that equality with God means the sameness or sharing something with God. You know, sameness and sharing, that seems to be the basic gist of what equal with God means. The second thing we have to note is that the claim to be equal with God is striking because in Jewish metrics, uh, claiming to be equal with God is literally, literally one of the most blasphemous things you could ever claim to be. You know, in the in the book of Isaiah, you know, God has no equal. He has no rival. Uh, so any claim to equality with God or to have a comparable status with God is going to meet with some degree of uh, consternation or derision or critique. Uh, also, the Maccabean epitomist, uh, he imagines Antiochus Epiphanes IV, uh, you know, in the final throes uh, of his life, suffering from a torment of the bowels, and he kind of dies acknowledging with these words, it is right to be subject to God. Mortals should not think that they are equal to God. You know, that's an important phrase on the lips of a supposed enemy of the uh, Judean people. Uh, but turning our minds elsewhere, if you look at someone like the Jewish philosopher Philo of Alexandria, um, he, he says this, he says, only the mind that is atheistic and devoid of love would haughtily think itself equal with God. Uh, we can look at another uh, Hellenistic uh, Jewish writing, the Sibylline Oracles, in particular, uh, Book 5, where there the Jewish Sibyl attributes the claim to be equal with God as something that a revivified and returning Nero would say. So it's something only said by the bad guys. Antiochus Epiphanes IV, that really bad Syrian king who desecrated the temple, thought himself divine or something Nero would say. Uh, there is something analogous in the fourth gospel in the gospel of John. It, uh, we're told there that the, uh, the Judeans in chapter 5 were seeking to kill Jesus, not only because he transgressed the Sabbath, but because uh, by claiming to have God as his father, it meant he was making himself equal with God. Now, I suspect that that remark is a feature of Johannine irony, okay, uh, whereby uh, Jesus is equal to God as a father is equal to his son, but the Judeans wrongly think that Jesus is making himself a second and independent deity by you know, ushering in such a claim. Uh, but any, in any case, you should get the impression from that, uh, claiming to be equal with God in, in Jewish metrics and Jewish measurements is normally regarded as very blasphemous. And yet it's something that is claimed for Jesus in this, in this poem. 
Uh, the second thing we've got to note, and this is very much a part of the Greco-Roman context, is that in the ancient world, there, there was a thing where someone could be acclaimed or celebrated as equal to the gods. Now, that could be true for kings, emperors, or other exemplary individuals. Uh, the historian Appian says that Julius Caesar was the first of the Roman leaders to receive post-mortem post honors equal to gods, okay? Uh, even Philo, you know, who in some senses is a, is a strict monotheist, uh, he argues that certain cities with a, a degree of a fittingness, you know, uh, celebrated the Roman Emperor Augustus as being equal to the Olympian gods. Uh, elsewhere, much later, uh, Dio Cassius recorded how Roman senators voted that Augustus's name should be listed as equal to the gods in civic hymns. Now, this equality with God is not really a matter of being or ontology. It's a kind of ultimate political status. To be afforded honors equal to the gods, equal to those given to the highest deities, means one has achieved a degree of superlative power and status. So it's not about a divine nature per se. It has a, a, a political meaning with religious connotations. But is that is that political sense what is intended here in Philippians 2? Is Jesus being heralded as equal to the God in the same sense that a Roman emperor or someone of renown may have been celebrated as equal to the gods? Uh, now, if that was the case, then I would expect Jesus to be labeled as equal to God as part of his exaltation at the very end of the poem. So, you know, Jesus has the form of God, uh, he becomes a servant, uh, he suffers, is crucified, then he's exalted. Then you might think he would be made equal to the gods or equal to God if this somewhat honorific and quasi-religious political meaning is the one intended. Uh, but I, I'm just not sure that's what it is, because in my reading of the poem, equality with God is something he already possesses. More on that soon to come. We'll have to park that one to later. Okay, so just to, just to recap there, we've looked at the meaning of equal with God. We've looked at it means some degree of sameness or sharing in something that pertains to God. We've noted also that equal with God is one of the most blasphemous things someone can say or claim in Jewish metrics. And we've noted how it does have a particular meaning, not just in the, uh, the Roman imperial cult, uh, but generally kings and figures of antiquity could be worshipped as equal to the gods. And that was a way of celebrating that they'd had, a, they'd had reached the pinnacle of human accomplishment. But what about this, this difficult word, harpagmos? Okay, what about that? Because whatever equality with God is and entails, uh, the point is Jesus did not consider equality with God to be harpagmos. So what is harpagmos? Well, according to uh, BDAG, that's the, the standard lexicon in New Testament studies, harpagmos means something to do with something one grips onto or grasps after. But it can also have a more general sense of robbery, rape, or rapacious activity like plundering. Uh, you know, Plutarch, the Roman philosopher, said that uh, Alexander the Great did not treat Asia Minor as something to be pillaged or plundered. You know, he, he did not simply use it to be harpagmized or harpagzing or something along those lines. Uh, there's also a good article uh, by a scholar, Catherine uh, Shana, uh, that's in biblical interpretation in the journal there. And she argues in light of Roman visual representations of power, where it's very much, it's sexualization of violence, you know, depicting conquered people as, as being, you know, raped, defiled, plundered, uh, you know, it, it may have that kind of connotation, you know, which would kind of mesh with the old King James translation that, you know, um, that Jesus thought it not robbery to be equal with God or something along those lines. Now, if you do think in terms of that general metaphor of rapacious activity, kind of imperial violence, it would mean Jesus did not attain or sustain equality with God by violence. Jesus did not wield or win equality with God 
in a violent way. So if it's part of this general idea of robbery, looting, plunder, all sorts of um, violence, uh, it, it could have that, that kind of meaning. But most likely, I think harpagmos is not just a general description of rapacious violence. It's actually an idiom for something. And the, the debate is whether that idiom means something that's grasped onto or something that is grasped after. And there's generally two ways of dealing with harpagmos in verse 6. Uh, one is called the res rapta interpretation. And that means holding onto or exploiting something one already has. In this context, it would mean the pre-existent Jesus did not exploit or take advantage of his divine status. Uh, then there is what might, we might call the, or uh, well, what is called the Raz Repienda view, and that is mean uh, something that one seizes after that one does not, in fact, yet possess. Uh, that would mean Jesus did not, like Adam, like Satan, or an emperor, try to usurp after divine status, a kind of equality with God. Now, these different views will come out in different translations. So for the res rapta view, you get translations like this, you know, in the Common English Bible. It says, though he was in the form of God, he did not consider being equal with God something to exploit. So it's something he already has. Uh, in the New Testament for everyone, from N.T. Wright, uh, it says, who, though in God's form, did not regard his equality with God as something he ought to exploit. Then there's the NIV, uh, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. And then there's the voice, though he was in the form of God, he did not choose to cling to equality with God. And you can see the sense there, uh, that equality with God is something he, he already possesses, but he won't, he won't cling on to it, won't hold on to it, won't prize it or exploit it. But then there are the res repienda translations that we find. And that's where Jesus could be uh, potentially grasping after, after something. So you've got the NRSV updated edition, which says, who though he was, he exists in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped. Uh, similarly, there's the NASB, which tends to be a fairly literal translation, which says, who although he exists in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. And then there's the revised Geneva translation, which talks about how Jesus was in the form of God and did not eagerly desire equality with God as a prize. So, so you got those two views, res rapta and res rapienda. So which one is it? Is it res rapta? Uh, is equality with God something Jesus possessed but did not exploit? Or is it res rapienda? Is equality with God something Jesus did not try to violently seize plunder? or assert for himself. Uh, now, this can be a very technical debate, and it depends on which context one uh, privileges. Does one privilege the sort of Greco-Roman context, where you've got like the imperial cult and equality with God as a type of honor, and Jesus didn't try to usurp that like a uh, pretender to the imperial throne? Is that the image? Is it a general description of the robbery or rap rapacious behavior Jesus refused to engage in, you know, and in light of imagery of the ancient world on coins and various reliefs, that's, that's possible. Uh, but with most commentators, uh, I generally tend to think that harpagmos here is being used in an idiomatic way. And this goes back to a, a fairly uh, well-known and uh, celebrated article by Roy Hoover from the 1970s, who argued that uh, harpagmos or harpagma, uh, when used with double accusative nouns and certain verbs, is idiomatic for something to seize upon and take advantage of. So most people argue that that is indeed the case. But uh, in a subsequent article, Michael Martin, I think is right, that whether the thing seized uh, in the sense of clutching onto what one already has or grasping after what one does not yet have, that is not really answered by the idiom. That is answered more so by the immediate context. So I do think there is an idiom here, uh, but whether the thing that is grasped onto or after, uh, that'll depend on the particular context in question. So what does the context here tell us? Well, I tend to think that equal with God 
seems to be synonymous or at least uh, derivative of Jesus being in the form of God. I mean, that's how the poem starts up, starts off, you know, you know, though he, he was in the form of God, uh, he did not consider equality with God. And I think, you know, in that, in that sort of uh, breakdown of the verse, uh, equality with God is either para is parallel to form of God, which means it's either the same thing or it's a corollary, it's a consequence of being in the form of God. By virtue of being in the form of God, he also has equality with God, okay? Uh, and if, if you read it in the context, I think that that makes a lot of sense. Equality with God is not about harpagmos, but about ekinosin, okay? Which would mean, it's been self-emptying. So equality with God is not a matter of seizing, grasping, usurping something, perhaps of what some already has, in their possession, such as, you know, being in the form of God, but it means becoming a servant. And we could also add to that, that there's maybe a, a mimetic element going on here. In, in other words, part of the purpose of this, this Christ poem is to uh, bring people to imitate the example of Christ. I mean, that's, that's how Paul starts off, you know, have the same mind as Christ Jesus. Though he was in the form of God, he did not consider equality with God something to be exploited for his own advantage, you know, you can tell them doing the uh, res raptor interpretation. And, and that, that kind of dovetails or it meshes with the wider context of the letter. Uh, you know, in chapter three, Paul argues that he largely set aside his inherited Jewish privileges to become the apostle to the Gentiles. And, and that mirrors something that Jesus did. Jesus set aside his equality with God, uh, being in the form of God to become a servant. Okay, to become obedient on the point of death and death on the cross. And we know from Paul's theology that the cross is, of course, redempted, redemptive. And that obviously speaks to the Philippians, who I think Paul is telling them they've got to be prepared to give up their civic privileges as citizens of Philippi, as citizens of the empire, to be servants of God, to be servants to each other. So that's why I think a, a, a res raptor interpretation makes sense. Uh, it seems to be based more on the idiom, but the idiom doesn't really tell you if it's something that's snatched onto or snatched after, but I think the context does, okay? Because equality with God and form of God are set in parallel, and equality with God is not about snatching, holding onto something, but emptying oneself, becoming a servant. That seems to be the, the, main, the, main, the main point going on. Uh, N.T. Wright puts this very well, and he's got a fairly famous quote from his book, Climax of the Covenant. He says this, the pre-existent son regarded equality with God, not as excusing him from the task of redemptive suffering, but actually as uniquely qualify him for that vocation. Or to give a, another quote, a somewhat longer one from uh, New Zealand Presbyterian New Testament scholar Mark Huan. He's got a very good Philippians commentary. I mean, I mean, Nije Gupta have written one, but I've got to admit, I think Mark Huan's is, is, is pretty good. Uh, he says this. Uh, he says, Jesus gave no consideration to the use of his divine power, privilege, status, and glory, legitimately or coerci coercively to achieve his ends. Rather, he chose the path of self-emptying, selflessness, service, joining humanity as a true human, obedience, suffering, and death. He demonstrated true divinity, refusing to exploit his power, to hold onto it, or to use his supremacy to overthrow his world. Universal submission will ultimately come because God has exalted him and restored him to his glorious cosmic status, not through violent overthrow, but through humble submission. Without resorting to harpagmos, he who is creator and king of the world has now come to take back what evil and corruption has attempted to wrest from him with harpagmos. So to summarize, I think then that Jesus' equality with God is his uh, pre-existent proximity to God and his participation in the divine nature. This equality with God is not something he refused to seize after, but something he already possessed. It was something he refused to prize and protect. Uh, instead of all that, he surrendered his divine status by taking on the status and state of a slave. So Philippians 2.6, uh, equality with God, Harpagmos, I think this is about self-giving, um, self-surrender, and self-abasing for the sake of of others. And that provides a paradigm for Paul and a model for the Philippians to emulate 
themselves. Uh, if you check out the show notes, uh, particularly on the YouTube channel, you can see a little bibliography I've, I've got there, some recommended reading. Uh, otherwise, the next episode is going to be on kenosis, the meaning of self-emptying. Uh, until then, do me a favor, uh, like, share, leave a comment, leave a review when you can. And I look forward to seeing you next time on the channel. Take care until then.